In September of 1891, Theodore Roosevelt and his ranch partner, Bob Ferguson, embarked on a lengthy pack trip to hunt elk in the Wyoming Rockies. Roosevelt called it his most memorable hunt. Some years later, he recorded the events of this hunt in his book, The Wilderness Hunter. This picture was filmed in the vicinity of this famous hunt. The finest hunting ground in America was, and indeed is, the mountainous region of western Montana and northwestern Wyoming. It is a high, cold region of many lakes and clear, rushing streams, with lofty peaks carved in fantastic and extraordinary shapes. The mountains of northwestern Wyoming embody a rich hunting heritage. The Bighorn Basin lies between two mountain ranges, the Bighorn Mountains to the east and the Absarokas to the west. The Absarokas are part of the Rocky Mountain Range and are characterized by dramatic peaks and rugged drainages. <laughs> The basin is a sportsman's paradise, rich in wildlife and wide open spaces. The historic town of Cody was established on the east side of the mountains in 1896. Today, it is a center of Old West culture and the eastern gateway to Yellowstone National Park. The Buffalo Bill Historic Center is considered one of the finest museums of Western history in the United States. The center includes extensive Western art, firearms, and Indian exhibits. Near the west edge of Cody, another remnant of the Old West is prominent. The trail Town is a collection of historic buildings and authentic artifacts assembled through the efforts of a longtime Wyoming native, Bob Edgar. Bob and his wife, Terry, live at the entrance of the Old Town and spend considerable time managing and maintaining the collection. For Bob, it has been a mission of preservation, and it is a purely private undertaking without funding from federal or state agencies. Old Trail Town is a result of being concerned about the history of this country and the old buildings that were here in the frontier years that have been destroyed, many of them have. So at one point, about 26 years ago, we decided to start trying to collect and preserve these old buildings. At this point, we've now got uh, 23 buildings that date between 1879 and 1901. And along with the buildings, we're also trying to collect the memorabilia of the Old West, the wagons, clothing, guns, various implements of the period. This cabin was built by Jim White and Oliver Hanna, his buffalo hunting partner, in the fall of 1880 on the Bighorn Mountains. Jim White began his buffalo hunting career on the Southern Plains in 1870 and hunted all through that region until 1878 when the Southern herd was wiped out. At that point, he looked around for other country to hunt buffalo and came north to Wyoming and Montana. He became a partner with Oliver Hanna, a man that he met up in this region that had been a scout with Crook and knew the country pretty well. 
They hunted the Bighorn Mountains, the Yellowstone River country, and then came back into the Bighorn Basin of Wyoming in the fall of 1880. Uh, there they built this cabin at their hunting camp. White was killed there by thieves in the fall of 1880. His partner, Hannah, uh, buried him on the bench above the creek. Hannah said Buff, Jim White was one of the greatest buffalo hunters of the West. He said that he asked him one time how many buffalo he'd killed and he dug out an old ledger book from a greasy bag and started counting off so many here, so many there, so many here. Hannah said he quit counting at 16,000. Jeremiah Johnson was another hunter associated with this region of the Rocky Mountain West. This legendary mountain man, whose actual name was John Johnston, is also buried at this site in Trail Town. In the early 70s, a popular movie starring Robert Redford depicted the life of Johnston. Johnston was originally buried at a military cemetery near San Diego, California. In 1974, the body was moved to this site. A special funeral drew several thousand spectators, and Robert Redford attended as a pallbearer. After the turn of the century, other hunters and guides became well known. Ned Frost was one of the famous big game hunters of this region. He came into the area with his family in 1885. He was only four years old at the time. The family moved into the South Fork of the Shoshone River. And here at this point, they, they planned to hunt bear and uh, other game. As he grew up, he expanded his his uh, territory later became a partner with Fred Richards. They started the first outfitting business in this area known as the Frost and Richards Outfitting Camp. They hunted trophy mountain sheep, uh, elk, grizzly bears in this country for many years and had the reputation of being the best guides and hunters of this region. Of all the famous mountain men and hunters associated with this historic area, none bear a greater significance than he for whom the town was named. Colonel Bill Cody was a hunter, frontiersman, and a world ambassador of the Old West. Just west of town, near the east entrance to Yellowstone Park, Cody's original hunting lodge is still standing. Buffalo Bill's hunting lodge, Pahaska Teepee, was completed about 1902 on the 50 miles west of Cody on way into Yellowstone Park. The name comes from an Indian name, uh, Pahaska means long hair, and that's the way Buffalo Bill uh, wore his hair most of the time, and it was named because of that. Many dignitaries from Europe and, and the United States came out to hunt with Buffalo Bill, and they stayed in the lodge. The lodge had uh, upper floor with rooms all the way around the balcony, a big stone fireplace, and it was a, a very attractive lodge. One of the famous hunts taken out of the Pahaska Lodge was the, the hunt where Buffalo Bill took Prince Albert of Monaco up the river into the mountains north of the lodge, hunting grizzly bear, elk, mountain sheep. They had a very successful hunt up in that country and uh, killed some nice trophies. Uh, before they came back down from the hunt, there was a tree there at the camp, and here they put Camp Monaco, uh, 1913, and that tree still exists there on that camp. At the center of Cody is the historic Irma Hotel. It was built by Bill Cody as a destination hotel for those coming west to visit Yellowstone and other western attractions. The hotel is still in operation today. The structure was built in 1902 and was named for his youngest daughter, Irma. The halls of the hotel were lined with photographs of the Wild West show, Indian pictures, cowboys. Uh, he also had a lot of paintings. Buffalo Bill was an art collector in those years and, and he had numerous big paintings in the hotel. Many of those are still there. The hotel uh, housed many dignitaries at the time, kings and queens and counts from foreign countries, uh, dignitaries from the east, hunters that came here to hunt in the mountains with Buffalo Bill. 
There's all kinds of stories. It's a beautiful place and it's something to see even today. Well, story has it that Queen Victoria gave Buffalo Bill this back bar as a gift. She was impressed with his performance of the Wild West show in England and, and liked Buffalo Bill as a person and wanted to contribute to his big hotel in the West. The back bar and front bar was no doubt shipped here by steamship, came west on the railroad as far as Red Lodge, Montana, 65 miles north of Cody. Then it was, I'm sure it was dismantled and, and hauled into Cody by freight wagon to the hotel and then pieced back together where it is now. The, the fancy carved buffalo head I'm, on the front of it surely was a special order for Buffalo Bill. It matches the buffalo head that is carved out of red stone on the front of the hotel. In itself, packing is both an art and a mystery, and a skillful professional packer, versed in the intricacies of the diamond hitch, packs with the speed which no non-professional can hope to rival. Ron Doobie operates Absaroka Wilderness Outfitters from his ranch on the North Fork of the Shoshone River. I'm one of the luckiest guys in the whole world. My best friend and partner, my lovely wife Carol and I, have been married for 33 years. Over 20 years ago, Carol and I and our four boys were fortunate enough to be able to move to Wyoming and make a living riding and packing horses and mules and helping people enjoy God's wonderful outdoors. Recently, Carol and I had the opportunity to purchase a new ranch, new for us anyways, with a beautiful log home in the magnificent Wapiti Valley, 21 miles west of Cody, Wyoming. Our nearest neighbors are deer and elk, and we're located just a quarter of a mile from the National Forest, halfway between our deer camp and our wilderness elk camp. Ron's season begins in early summer with recreational pack trips for backcountry fishing and sightseeing. When people come on our summer pack trips, they're likely to see lots of wildlife lots of elk, some moose, perhaps even some bears. They'll see a lot of bird life, ducks and geese and pelicans, which is kind of neat. Of course, they'll see some dynamite scenery, some of the best scenery of the world. And if they like to fish, they'll be able to fish for native cutthroat trout. One of the guests on this trip is Mike Cernich, an avid fly fisherman from Spokane. Mike will be trying his luck for cutthroat trout on the famous Thoroughfare River. Ron Doobie's son, Steve, will be guiding Mike on the thoroughfare. Steve will also be in charge of taking care of the entire entourage of summer guests on this August pack trip. We specialize in taking lots of family groups on pack trips. That's a really good opportunity for people to get to know one another better and to enjoy the great out of doors. We've taken children as young as six years old and as, as young as 76 years old. Early the next morning, Steve and Mike were on the water. The Thoroughfare River is named after the Thoroughfare Plateau. The Thoroughfare Plateau, of course, was named by the Indians before the coming of the white man. It was called the Thoroughfare because of the large herds of elk that migrate across the Thoroughfare Plateau in the late fall when they go to their wintering grounds. That, of course, brings the name Thoroughfare Buttes to a couple of mountains that are very prominent landmarks, and then the Thoroughfare River.
Mike is an experienced fly fisherman and has spent many days on rivers and streams throughout the West. This, however, is his first trip into the thoroughfare. The Thoroughfare River is not very well known because it's located entirely within a wilderness area. Anywhere from the closest point to access the Thoroughfare River is approximately 30 miles from the trailhead from the nearest road. Because of the remoteness of the area in which the Thoroughfare River flows, it hasn't been subjected to extreme fishing pressure. People have to go in horseback. It's a long pack trip. It takes two days to get there. Consequently, it's little known, but the fishing is outstanding. Yeah, beautiful fish. Yeah. Beautiful. What nice do you fish. figure, about 17? Oh, well, that would be my guess. Quite that see. long? Yep. My hand won't open up because I'm cold. <laughs> yeah, it's been quite but, a cold morning, hasn't it? My hand's about eight and a half. I'd say he was about 17. 17. Yeah. Yeah, he's a dandy. That's a pretty nice looking pool, huh, Mike? Oh, yeah, they're just jumping and swimming around everywhere in there. Oh, there was another ride right there. Two of them. Whoop. Right there, right <laughs> in front of me. I better drop a hook right up there. Ho, ho, yeah! Yeah, you got one there, Steve. Woo. Well, I tell you what, there's a lot of fish in this hole. The most successful fishing techniques in the thoroughfare are fly fishing and spin cast fishing, oh. using little wobbler lures like Panther Martins or those silver dollar lures, little jakes. For fly ship fishing, we use humpies and a number of little wet flies. Some people like dry flies, which can offer some spectacular fishing. It's really a great opportunity to catch some beautiful fish. Pull that line off, right? Yes. Boy, what a dandy, huh? Nice fish. Look at that. Boy, is he a beauty. Nice red, just like all of them. Nice cut there in the throat. Nice red on the side. Yep. Well, what a yep. corker. Boy, isn't this yeah. fun? Good. Yeah, he should. Yeah. Well, should we catch some more for the frying pan there? I think so. Okay. I think we ought to get a couple more of these today. Good. The only fish that are found in the thoroughfare drainage, which of course is in the main Yellowstone drainage, are native cutthroat trout, the Yellowstone River cutthroat trout. People ask me from time to time where these fish came from, who stocked them, and I tell them they were stocked many, many, many years ago by a guy named God. All of the fish are approximately the same size, three and a half to five and a half years old. They're 16 to 18 inch migratory fish that spawn in the tributaries of the Yellowstone River. They come from Yellowstone Lake. They make their annual spring migration in June generally, and they're in the river till about the middle of August. The best time to fish for these fish when, it holds, when the river holds the highest populations is in July. A summer trip with the Doobies is a complete wilderness experience, including a spectacular pack trip, cooking over an open fire, and on this trip, an unexpected visit from an old friend and cowboy. Their tails are all matted. Well, hello, Val. Hi, Steve. How you doing? Good. How about yourself? Oh, gosh. I'm doing great. Boy, sure looks good. Yeah. Well, yeah. looks like you made it OK. Oh, yeah. No looks troubles? Doing great. Doing no, no troubles whatsoever. Good. Get a little iron put on there, huh? Yeah, well, we're working on it. Oh, well, that's good. Get everything. How is everybody doing? They're doing good. Good, Real good. good. Gosh, that's great. This sure is a pretty place here. I like never... it up here, huh? Oh, gosh, it's just gorgeous. I've never been in this valley before. but. Mountain pick something. Yeah, it sure is. Nice sure place is. to call home, isn't it? Oh, it's wonderful, wonderful. Everybody having a good time? Yeah, they are. Well, that's good. That's good. Well, we got a pot of coffee on the fire for you. You got a pot? I'll, I'll tell you, I joined you in a cup. Would you? Yeah. What yeah. about a little guitar playing maybe a little later? Well, now I could be coasted into that maybe for a meal or so. Good. Okay, Pard, we'll do it. Okay. 
Good, good. Come on in, I'll show you the coffee. Okay, well, let's bring this horse in and tie him up. Rolly poly, Brian's a little fatty. <laughs> Bread and jelly 20 times a day. <laughs> Many people tell us that one of the highlights of our trips is when Val Geisler rides in the camp. Val is a professional cowboy entertainer. He's quite a storyteller and uh, a, a, a guitar player and, and a western singer. He really adds a lot to the flavor of our trips when we accommodate family groups, of course. His entertainment is geared to family values and younger people. <laughs> After several days of fishing and exploring the back country, it was time to leave. Time to leave behind some good memories and some great fishing. As the string lined out for the return home, we bid a final farewell to this wild river called the Thoroughfare. <laughs> Hunting in the wilderness is, to me, of all pastimes, the most attractive. The wilderness hunter must not only show skill in the use of rifle and address in finding and approaching game, but he must also show the qualities of hardihood, self-reliance, and resolution needed for effectively grappling with his wild surroundings. Of all the big game animals of the West, none is more coveted than the bull elk. Elk freely inhabit most areas of the Rocky Mountains from British Columbia to New Mexico. The Absaroka Range, just east of Yellowstone National Park, offers some of the best elk habitat in the Rocky Mountain West. Many famous hunts have been recorded in this area, including several by the legendary outdoor writer Jack O'Connor. Our hunt begins about 50 miles east of Cody where Eagle Creek emerges from the remote regions of the Bridger, Teton, and Shoshone National Forests. Eagle Creek Trailhead is located just off the Yellowstone Highway, just six miles east of the park entrance. Mike Fitzgerald has driven over 35 hours from his home in Morganton, North Carolina to the Eagle Creek Trailhead for a 10-day wilderness elk hunt. Steve Doobie is expecting Mike's arrival and looking forward to renewing their acquaintance. Ron Doobie will not be in camp this year as he is in Mongolia consulting on an international hunting venture. Ready to go up there and look for a couple bulls? Sure am. You've yeah. been seeing some begging? Yeah, we've been seeing plenty of them. Good. Yeah, Mike good. and the Doobies have known each other for almost 12 years. During this time, Mike has made numerous trips to Wyoming to hunt and fish with the Doobies. Preparing a pack string for a 27-mile trip is intensive work. Because this is a designated wilderness area, everything that is packed in must be brought out at season's end. This includes tents, wood stoves, cots, and all man-made implements.
Because the task is so enormous, different detachments depart as they are ready. The first to leave will be the main body of hunters along with their personal gear. Another group will follow with food supplies and grain for the livestock. Mike will ride in with the last group and will not arrive till late afternoon. Got him ready, have you? Yep, we do. Okay. Well, you ready to get down that trail, go find a bull? Yeah, boy. Ready okay. to go. Good. Okay. Well, I'll meet you down the trail a little while. All right. I got to take care of some stuff here and I'll see you in the morning up there. Okay. Okay. Good enough. Yep, take care. See you, Mike. By 9.30, the final group of horses and riders are off. It'll be a lengthy trip, 27 miles to Mountain Creek Camp, and at least 10 days in the backcountry before they cross Eagle Creek at the trailhead again. Pack train's coming in. Looks like they made it. How are you? All right, how are you? Pretty good. You Mike Fitzgerald? Yeah, I am. I'm Wayne Landry. Glad to meet you. Nice meeting you. How was your trip in? Oh, it was good. It's a long ways in here, yeah. but... Takes a while to get here, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's a pretty scenic <laughs> way, though. It really is good. nice. You didn't have any troubles on the way in? No, no. Good. A couple of backpackers saw some bears down there. Oh, did they? Yeah, scared yeah. the fool out of them. Well, there's been a few around. Yeah. So, well, at least they didn't get after you guys, huh? Well, you guys been seeing a lot of elk? Oh, there's been a few, but it's uh, been kind of warm, so they've been kind of holding up in the timber. Uh-huh. But, uh, yeah, there's still some around, though. Oh, well, good. <laughs> we'll try to get one. Yeah. The old pony's kind of tired, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. I imagine you're a little tired from this. Uh, oh, a little bit. Too, huh? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Well, we'll get your gear gathered up, and if you want to come with me, I'll show you to your tent. Okay. Thanks. Well, Mike, this will be your accommodations for the week. Okay. We got a good. Most of our first-time clients are very surprised to see the extensive facilities that we maintain at the Mountain Creek Camp. All of our equipment, of course, has to be brought in in late August and then removed at the end of hunting season in late October. But we provide a 16 by 20 cook tent, a 16 by 20 dining tent. These are canvas wall tents with five foot side walls. We have four 12 by 14 tents to accommodate the hunters, two hunters in each tent. We have an eight by 10 shower tent. We have a platform which is similar to the caches used in Alaska to secure food items from the grizzly bears. Although man sometimes likes to hunt alone, often it is well to be with some old mountain hunter, a master of woodcraft, who is a first-rate hand at finding game, creeping upon it, and tracking it when wounded. Hey, Bert. I want you to meet your hunter for this week. This is Mike Fitzgerald. Pleased to meet you, Mike. This nice is, meeting you. This, this is Bert Bell. He'll be your guide this on this hunt. Okay. Uh, have you hunted before? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You've, you've been out before, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're a pretty good shot. Oh, fire, yeah. Well, good. I think so. Good. I've guided around here for a lot of years. Is that right? Yeah. You know, I help set the trees out all around here. <laughs> is you know? that right? Yeah. <laughs> well, Bert knows his way around these hills pretty well. I think he'll do you a good job. Well, that's good. That's good. Now, we've been hearing some bugle, you know, and stuff. So you have? Yeah, we've been out checking around. We know uh -huh. we've got areas spotted where they're, where they're hanging around. Got one tied to a tree, have mm -hmm. you? <laughs> now, what we... But we got to leave early in the morning. Okay. Yeah, oh, but way before daylight. Well, I'll be ready. Okay. Yeah. And we'll... Uh, you guys just holler. We'll get a run on him. 
Now, the other thing is, do you have comfortable shoes and stuff? Oh, yeah, so yeah. So you can climb? Yeah. Because, and you'll be quiet in the timber. Yeah, it's, like a mouse. Okay, yeah. that's all we need then, is, is be quiet sneaking through the timber. Because yeah. uh, we try to outrun them a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah. And that's not easy to do. No, I, I don't guess so. <laughs> turned out to be a great matchup. Mike, an easygoing sportsman with a love for horses, mules, and the wilderness, and Burt Bell, a real Wyoming cowboy and veteran guy. When surrounded with beauty like this, it's hard to concentrate on hunting. And this first morning was truly a stunning performance of wilderness splendor. One of the reasons Ron Duby chose to outfit in this area of the Rockies was the unique character of the area. One of the exciting aspects of hunting our country is the after effects of the Yellowstone fires of 1988. At that time, because of dry conditions, five years of drought, lightning caused fires ravaged this country, burning up approximately 45% of the timber. This, of course, has opened up the bedding areas, the black timber, and caused the proliferation of green feed that the elk, of course, really enjoy. It also makes the elk more visible. They still use the burnt timber as bedding areas, but now they're easier to find, which has really helped us to maintain very high success ratios. It didn't take long to see that elk were indeed active in the area. I want you to look at that rub right over there. Yeah, I'm looking at that. Is that a dandy? Uh-huh. Let's go on over there and look at it. All right. Uh, Mike, what them, what these elk will do? They'll whip these trees with their horns, and they're 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 rubbing the velvet off from them. See, uh -huh. getting them all polished up, ready for the rut, ready for the for the season. And they'll just rip these little old trees all apart. Yeah, I've I been noticing a few as we've been riding along. Yep. And How old would you say that rub is there? That rub doesn't look like it's been within the past week here is what uh -huh. it looks like to me. Yeah. Sure. sure work them over good. Well, we're only a week behind him then, huh? That's right. I think we can catch him. Okay. If Wallows are another sign of elk activity, and the Mountain Creek area seems to have plenty of these. With the evening shadows lengthening, Mike and Bert turned their horses toward camp. And even though no shots were fired, this day concluded with the quiet satisfaction found only in the wilderness. Back at camp, rumors of a bear confrontation were circulating. Hey, Dick, I heard you guys had a little excitement today. Yeah, we didn't get an elk, but we had a little run in with a bear. Is that right? Yeah, big, big old grizz. Big grizzly, huh? Yeah, he's got frosted all over, and, and I bet he went at least, I bet he's pushing 500 pounds at least. Is that right? How close did you get? Closer than I wanted to. <laughs> How close was that? Well, we were just, we went but a couple minutes out of camp here, and, 
just walking up the ridge there and uh, sneaking along real good. And I heard this kind of a little wolf, you know, and I got as soon as I heard that, I knew it was a bear. And I looked around, and he's coming underneath us, but angling away from us. And I spun around, and I told Tom, I said, oh, boy. And, uh, of course, Tom, he spun around, too. And as soon as I seen that, said that, that bear picked his head up, and, God, he just charged right up the hill. And I hollered at Tom. I was afraid he was going to pop him one. So I just said, don't shoot, don't shoot. And, uh, of course, he had his rifle down. I had my pistol out. He ran up and uh, kind of stood up on his hind legs, not fully extended, but just kind of stuck his head, nose up. He couldn't wind us. And then all of a sudden, he just, and woofing all the time, and just bouncing back and forth. And then he dropped back down on all fours, and God, he charged within 20 feet of us, and just woofing and just making a heck of a racket, and then, but still confused. And uh, then he kind of quartered away from us, and I thought, well, he's going to leave, you know. And God, he run around, and like I say, just woofing all the while, made a circle around, and come in, got up above us, and uh, oh, maybe he was then about 30 yards away. And then all of a sudden he caught our scent, and he kind of stuck his head up like that and dropped down. And he he come down the hill at us a little bit, and then he took off, and then I thought, oh, he's going to be gone, you know. And all the while, we're backing away from him, and God, we keep slipping and sliding. <laughs> God, I was uh, ready to go down, and when he started away, I thought, well, he's going to be gone. And God, all of a sudden, he just turned and come right at us. And uh, oh, we stopped within about 20 feet, and like I say, just woofing and making noise all the while, and uh, I had the pistol uncocked and everything, and I was afraid, I was afraid Tom was going to shoot, because the last thing I want to do is shoot if you don't have to. It only took a couple seconds, but if he came any more, he was going to get all five of them, or <laughs> as many as I could get off. I might say one for myself <laughs> at the last minute, but... but uh, what did you guys Day two in the Wyoming Rockies. And Bert decided to take Mike to a place called Tunnel Meadows. Tunnel is a favorite spot for Bert, and over his years of guiding in this area, he has taken many bulls while watching these meadows. Ron encourages his hunters to be somewhat selective when hunting elk, and sometimes that means passing on a marginal bull. I feel very strongly that if sportsmen won't be excited about killing a little small average bull, a little raghorn, a four by five point, they definitely should consider going home empty and holding out for a bigger bull because that small bull may be a real trophy to someone else who's never killed one. As they approached the lower end of the meadow, they detected movement. There's one out in the wall there, Bert. Yes, sir. Look at him. Boy, he don't look very big, Mike. What's he look like to you? He looks like to me. Let me get my glasses here. I count him. Nearly a four. Yeah, I think he's a four. Yep. Yeah, that's, a, that's what he is, a four. A little small for us, ain't he? A little small. Mike, I've come here a lot of times and sit on this knob right here for a lot of years and, and sit here and watch these elk and, and stuff. And we've got quite a few bulls right, right out of this barn here. Well, Just, I can see why. It's a great place. Oh, man. This is, and you can see every direction. Well, if that one was a big six or seven, he'd be laying there dead now, wouldn't he? Probably. Well, he's a lucky feller today. But then there's another day. Oh, yeah. We'll get him next time. Okay. I mean, we'll, we'll find a bigger one. Than, now, I know there's bigger ones than this around oh, here. Oh, yeah. There might be a bigger one come down here in a little bit. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, we'll just wait and hang tight. Mike chose to pass on this small bull. Confident they would find a better one, they finished out the day at Upper Tunnel, then returned to the horses and mounted up for the ride back to camp.
Next morning, Bert decided to hunt up into the head of what is called Howell's Fork of Mountain Creek. They would ride most of the way, then hunt on foot as they ascend into the upper headwaters. By mid-morning, they did encounter a big bull. Unfortunately, this bull was the wrong species. This was a Shirus moose. Shirus moose are common in this area, but not overabundant. The moose is the largest member of the deer family. The largest live in Alaska, sometimes reaching seven and a half feet at the shoulder. They decline in physical size in their more southern ranges. This range spans from Maine to the Rocky Mountains and from Alaska to Wyoming. Ron does on occasion book a moose hunter in his area, but because tags are limited and hard to draw, it's somewhat sporadic. We accommodate one or two sheriff's moose hunters at our Mountain Creek camp on an annual basis. Moose, of course, are huge, majestic animals and add a little bit of spice to the flavor of our western hunts. Bullwinkle's encounter concluded, Bert and Mike decided to return to camp for lunch. This would be an opportunity to let the horses get some extra grain and rest, as well as a chance to just relax and enjoy the abundant beauty of this mountain creek country. Well, that was a pretty good lunch we had, wasn't it? Oh, boy, that was good. Nice lunch. Yeah. This weather is... Pretty nice for the middle of September, towards the last now. Well, it sure is. Real nice. But feel that wind, Mike. Yeah. There's a little story in that wind. And them clouds up there, they're showing a little something. Maybe we'll get something coming in here, some tracking snow or something. Well, we need some, don't we? Yeah, we sure do. Be nice. What's that old cabin over there, Bert? Well, by golly, Mike, let's go over and look at it. I can tell you a little something about it. Uh, what I know about it. Been there a long time, hasn't it? Hey, let's walk over there and, and look at it. All right. <laughs> you see, like this cabin's been here a long time. It was built a long time ago. It and looks like it. It has been rumored to me that Teddy Roosevelt stayed here when he was uh, uh, in here hunting in, the, in this country. Is that right? But I also know that an old trapper stayed here all winter long. Well, this old boy's name was Billy Howell, and there's a creek named after him up here, Howell Fork of Mountain Creek, because he spent so damn many years here uh, trapping every every winter. They, he, they could, you could depend on him being in here. Is that trapping. right? How long ago has that been? That must have been in the early 1900s. When, when he was doing that. Uh -huh. And so I know this cabin's been here that long. When did they quit trapping in here? In, in, they told me in 1928 they quit trapping his tree mark. There was a stove in here. It sat right around the corner here. It wasn't very big. It didn't take much of a stove to heat that little little cabin. No, I don't guess it did. And then you see this porch overhang here. He hung all of his hides out of the weather on this porch here. To, to stretch him and stuff uh -huh. before he got ready to uh, pack him up on his backpack and snowshoe out of here. Looks like it's about to fall down now, don't it? Well, it's it's a historic landmark and you can't repair a landmark. It's got to go down by itself. And when it goes down, they just let it go back to the ground. And they don't touch it or do anything with it. <laughs>
after a leisurely lunch break, horses were saddled and Bert and Mike made ready for the afternoon hunt. There are many methodologies to hunting elk. Seasoned guides like Bert usually develop their own strategies based on past experience. Ron Doobie, likewise, has his own ideas for the elk of Mountain Creek. In the early season, we prefer to use bugling tactics to find and call elk. We scour the country horseback and afoot using diaphragm calls, making elk bugle sounds to get the elk to respond to us. We feel that's a very exciting method, and our clients certainly agree. If that is unproductive for whatever reason, we like to get high and use our binoculars and do lots of glassing. Most people don't realize that elk can be active throughout the day. They may not be doing much roaming around, but they do get up and stretch and move and take a little bite to eat, and when they do so, they, they're visible. This is always pretty good here, Mike. A lot of times we have pulled him out down on this creek, and he's over there somewhere. You think we can? What if we get up on that ridge right there? And then, and then work, work down that ridge so we can see all of this country down here. Yeah. Let's do it. Okay. You go first, because I don't know when we're going to see him. Okay. As they gained the top of the ridge, the bull was still sounding off deep in the creek bottom. There he goes. I think he's a little closer. Bugling is certainly an effective method of drawing bulls, and Ron believes you don't necessarily have to be an expert to be successful. I'm a proponent of very aggressive elk calling, elk hunting techniques. I like to call loudly, and I like to call often. I like to keep putting pressure on the bull. If he moves away, I follow him. I feel that that can be a very effective technique as opposed to the more subtle, quiet, laid-back approach. People have been hunting elk for hundreds of years using a variety of calling techniques. It's only been within the past 12 to 15 years that sportsmen have learned how to use diaphragm calls that actually accurately replicate the sounds of a bull elk. The techniques used by the old timers of the gas pipe whistles, rifle cartridges, and little plastic tubes that make the flute-like sounds were extremely effective back many years ago and are still effective today. This one? Yeah, where'd you get that? Mike, I make these all, all the time. I bring one on every hunting trip I go on. Is that right? Yeah. I made them for years. And, and, and I bring them, I just take a piece of pipe and cut me a little whistle and put a little plug in them here, and I can draw a bull for half a mile with these. What's, what's that, like a spike call? Yeah, it's like a spike call. And them big bulls think they're going to come over here and kick a little ass, see? Uh -huh. and, wait a minute, let's wait till he goes again. Maybe 
he's not going to. Toot him and see if you can get him to answer. All right. Here we go. Dang, he answered you right back. Bo, yeah, this will draw him every time. Now, let's, let's wait, Mike, till he bugles again, and then you give him a shot with that one, okay? Okay. There he goes. Yeah. He's getting closer. Go ahead. Go ahead. Give him a shot with that. Boy, that was a good one. You really know how to use it. Sure. Okay. And he's getting closer. I'm gonna get ready. All right. Never will you see him sticking out in trees now. He'll probably stick his head out first. We gotta wait for his whole body to get out. Well, it's gonna be hard to get him out of there. Although this bull seems responsive, he is reluctant to move into the open. It's likely he has cows with him and is content to maintain a protective buffer. Mike, we've been here quite a while, and we've followed him down here about three times, and we can't get him out. Yeah, he keeps going back up higher every I know. time. Maybe we hadn't ought to work with him any more today. Maybe we'd ought to back off and come back tomorrow. Yeah, I don't think we're ever going to get him out. I don't think he's going to come out today. Right. We might get him out tomorrow. Yeah, he might be a little hotter tomorrow. Yeah, I think so. Well, we'll just pack up our junk and get out of here. Yeah. It's All right. exciting or anything. Okay. And we'll get him. Ready? Yeah, let's, let's ease back out of here. Okay. Rather than risk a botched stalk, Bert and Mike decided to try this guy again tomorrow. Perhaps then he'll be more antagonistic. Except in rare cases, the grizzly bear will not attack of his own accord. Still, when fairly brought to bay or when moved by a sudden fit of ungovernable anger, the grizzly is beyond peradventure a very dangerous antagonist. Next morning, Bert learned there had been some excitement in camp. It seems Wayne Landry, the camp manager, had an unexpected visit during the night. And although Wayne usually welcomes most visitors with the utmost hospitality, he had to decline this one. Yes, those are bear paw prints on the door. And yes, Wayne was awakened by this curious black bear sow and her two cubs during the night. After sniffing the perimeter of Wayne's tent, Mother Bear ambled over to the tack tent and broke it down by climbing onto the ridge pole. All this was done in an attempt to gain access to the elevated food cache. Later that day, Bert related a bear story of his own. Hold up here a minute, Mike. I'd like to tell you about something that happened to me one time quite a few years ago here in this area here let's uh let's go up this way here and i'll show you what, what happened okay let's see boy it's hard to tell about this mike you know that Yellowstone fire of 88. I bet it now does. Now it's all burned out. Let's go on up here to here. I think this is it up here. Let's that go up to this, up there. this one up here. All right. Yeah, this looks like a log, Mike, right here. Huh. 
Yeah, yeah, this is the place. Yeah, this was the, oh, it's September of 1967, September 13th. It was so long ago, it ain't even the truth anymore, I think. <laughs> but I was guiding a, a grizzly bear hunter, uh, and, and we was hunting from, from right here. We had a bait set up right over there in the edge of them trees, right at the edge of, edge of the meadow, and we come up around the back here. Mike, on the time that, that it happened, uh, we were sitting right here, and the bear did come in right on, on, on the bait right over there. Bert Bell's Brush with Death happened September 13th, 1967. Two days after his release from the hospital, Bert made a tape recording of the encounter for outdoor writer Ben East. The article was published in the November issue of Outdoor Life magazine in 1968. Some of the excerpts you will hear are from this tape recording Bert made just six days after the attack. As we pick up the story, Bert's hunter, Martin Solikowski, had shot the bear from this position on the evening of September 12th. The bear flinched and retreated into the thick timber. Thinking they had made a good shot, they decided to wait till morning to look for the bear. The next morning, they mounted their horses and returned to the scene. Bert and the camp wrangler, Dave Reinhardt, found the blood trail and began the search. So we went on a ways on the trail, and we found out we was on the right trail. We, as we came along to this, we came along to this creek, a small creek called Dyke Creek. And about that time, I think she knew more about us than we knew about her. But we looked across the creek, and over in there was a bunch of down timber about 30 yards over. It looked like a good place for her to set a trap and wait for us. So we sat down on the creek bank, and we glassed over into this down timber as much as possible, and it was all we could. We couldn't see her at all. We couldn't uh, see where she'd went in. The sun was melting the tracks pretty bad. So <clears throat> we decided that right across the creek was a couple of trees that looked like pretty handy for climbing, and we thought we could climb up those trees and see over in the down timber a little better, and then we could whistle for Jess if we could see her over in there somewhere. So we'd put the safeties on our rifles, and we crossed the creek and got by the trees and was saying something to each other, like, well, we better get climbed up these trees. And in these mountain pockets, the wind will kind of swirl on you a little. When it's blown from any direction, it'll swirl in these pockets. And it had kind of swirled a little bit, and I smelled her. And I knew then we were in her trap or we was too close to her. I had to do something quick. I didn't know what to I turned, and I faced the timber, and here she come over a log. I hit the safety on the rifle to try to push it off and pull the trigger, and it, I didn't get the safety off, and I was a pulling that dead trigger. I hit it three or four times, and I had that awful empty feeling in the bottom of my stomach about, oh, my God, that dead trigger. She uh, hit me like a freight train. We went down, and she grabbed me over the rib cage on the left side with her mouth on the lower part of the rib cage, and she bit down hard, and, boy, it really brought a squall out of me. But I thought, oh, my God, payday on a lonely mountainside. I'll never see my wife and kids again. And then I thought, oh, I hope Dave don't go to camp for help. I'm, I'm not dying, so I'll fight like hell for my wife. I could see Dave bringing up his rifle to make a shot about 20 yards away, and I, re I, th I, th I reached around to get her mouth off of my side. I grabbed her by the top jaw and the lower jaw and pulled just as hard as I could pull. I figured I'd feed her my hands and I could live without them, but I couldn't live without what was inside there that she was going to pull out in about another second or two if I didn't get it loose. So she did come loose, and about that time, Dave shot. I was looking right up the barrel of that rifle, and it just about blew my hair off. I, nothing happened. I felt all right, and I thought to myself, oh, my God, he's as panicked as I am. He's missed us both. But he hadn't. He had really hit. He had hit the bear, but not vitally. So I yelled to him. I yelled, "Dave, damn it, shoot the bear, not me!" And so I hung on. And Dave was running up. He cut the distance in half, run up halfway. In the meantime, she was setting up. She set right up on her rear end, and she was raised her right arm up to make a strike at me to wipe me off her head. And I was still hanging on, and she was making noises like I was trying to spit my fingers out, my hands out of her mouth. And I could see a bunch of blood running out of her mouth, and I knew I hadn't hurt her, so I was sure it was my blood that was running out of there. 
And as Dave was sighting in, I couldn't look up that rifle barrel again. And the only thing for me to look at was her eye. So I just looked her right square in the eye and waited. And just a second, Dave's shot went off. And I didn't feel nothing, and I didn't feel her shiver much, but her eyes started fading, and it started fading, and it, when it faded clear out, I knew that she was dead or dying. So I got, I let go of her and got up, and Dave run up and stuck the rifle up to her head again and, and shot again, and she just fell over. I looked down at my hands, and my left hand was bleeding awful bad, and my right hand was full of punctures, um, but they were just dripping, and my side, I couldn't see it, I couldn't see what was the matter. Dave ripped the front out of his shirt and, and made a tourniquet for my left hand, and we twisted that up, and I held it with my right hand, and then I thought, I asked Dave, I said, look at my side, what do you thought, what is my side? And he, well, he said, there's a lot of holes in your side, a lot of punctures, but he said, there isn't uh, no bleeding, they're all a-dripping, there's one small rip, it's a-dripping, but there's nothing bleeding too bad, and I said, well, good, let's get out of here, let's head for the horses. Well, that was one hell of a story, Bert. Well, yeah, I'll tell you, it was. I wouldn't want to do it again. I'll oh, tell you gosh, that. I guess not. Wow. Well, but, how, how'd you finally get out of the Well, thing? you see, we had to walk down from up there, clear back down here to these horses. And, uh, and I was bleeding out of my hand here pretty bad. And we got on, we got down to the horses and got to camp. And I rode out of here the next day. Hey, you know how far it is. You rode you out the go, next day. I rode out. Twenty-seven miles 27 after that. Twenty-seven miles. Oh, and, dang. And uh, rode out by myself. Is that right? And uh, got, I got into town and got to the hospital and stuff. So it wasn't that. But going out was pretty. Was I didn't know how much blood I'd lost. You know. Oh, and, I imagine and, so. Uh, yeah. That divide, you know, that Eagle Creek divide's pretty high, and I was really concerned about that. Uh, what it do to me that elevation? Uh huh. But it didn't. It didn't seem to seem to bother me any. My good old faithful horse. He took me all the way. Never, never bothered a bit. Is that right? Yeah. Well, those things happen when you're in the mountains, you know. Oh yeah. I guess a fellow's just lucky to get out of it. I wouldn't want to try it again. I'll tell you that. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Well, they don't have grizzly bear hunting here anymore, do they? No, it was closed in 1972. 1972. Yeah. So we haven't been able to hunt grizzly bear since. I guess it was closed for you in 67, though. Yes, it, it was. <laughs> no, I was back here again. Were you? Uh, guiding, uh, uh, guiding grizzly hunters. Is until, that right? Until 60, 69, I think. Uh -huh. And then a couple of years I didn't come, and, and then they closed it, so. Yeah. By six o'clock in the evening, I, I was in the hospital and had had supper and a lot of shots and was resting quietly. And at that time, I took time enough to give thanks to the man upstairs. Three days later, I was home with my family, out of the jaws of the big grizzly. The wild melody of the bugle rings from chasm to chasm under the giant pines, sustained and modulated through bar after bar, filled with proud anger. It thrills the soul of the listening hunter. By day eight of the hunt, both guide and hunter were becoming concerned that perhaps a good bull wasn't in the cards on this trip. Even so, they kept the faith and stayed afield. Mike, here's something I want to show you right here. Let's take a look at this. All right. See this? See all of this bark here? Yeah. Them grizzly bears ripped that off. See their claw marks in oh, there? Oh, look at them. Yeah. 
and they rip this bark off and then they go away and they let this bleed. See how it's bleeding? Yeah. And they come back and lick all that sap off of there. Uh huh. Now there's other trees around here like this. We're yeah, probably I've been noticing a few. We'll probably see some more. Uh huh. They spent most of the morning snooping around the base of Bull Ridge. Thickets of birch and aspen spread along the sides of the ridge are favorite hangouts of elk, and occasionally one catches a glimpse of movement. Seem to be much right, let's, let's move on around here and look some more. Around noon, Bert spotted elk in the creek bottom. It turned out to be a cow and calf, and as hard as they tried, no bull could be found. Let's move over here and start. Look, okay. right. over here, away. All right. When all else fails, sometimes the best thing to do is nothing. And after a tasty trail lunch, <laughs> that's exactly what Bert and Mike did. Mike, this is what you call real hunting. Yeah. You're supposed to be checking the inside of your eyelids for leaks right now. I don't have any leaks. I, no, don't, think. I don't think I do either. Maybe we ought to keep checking them here. The hardest part of this hunting is the ground, and it ain't very hard right here, is it? It's nice and fluffy. Yeah. I kind of like it right here. Yeah. After a satisfying alpine nap, Bert decided they should return to the upper Tunnel Meadows and spend the afternoon watching and listening. Well, I'd like to see a big one come out in this meadow, that wallow down there like that four-point did the other day. Yeah, but, Mike, we can't judge. We can't tell the big ones to come out. They didn't get big by being dumb. I know it. it w but it would be nice, wouldn't yes, it? Yes, it would. Because we've sat here and watched this quite a long while. Yeah. What do you say we back out of here a little early and, and go down to that big meadow down on Lower Tunnel and see if something will come out down there. Sounds like a good idea, because I don't know if there's much here. We didn't hear any bugling this morning or anything. No. Let's, Haven't seen a thing all day. Let's do that. Let's leave a little <coughs> early and, and get down there for while we still got some light. All right. You want to go now? Oh, I think we should. Okay. Let's go, then. Okay, we'll go back over here to the horse. They say it's never over till the fat lady sings. And although Mike and Bert were beginning to wonder, their fortune was about to change. As they emerged into the lower meadow, they stopped to listen before proceeding.
From the direction of the bugles, they determined the bull was above the meadow in the thick timber along the right side. They would have to stay in cover and try to call this guy in. Mike began cow calling immediately. The bull was responding and seemed to be moving closer. Presently, Mike saw a movement in the timber to the right. The bull was coming in. Watch the right part of the screen. Even though the bull stopped, Mike could only see the flank and had to wait for a better position. The shot was a solid hit. The bull was still on his feet, however and very hard to see through the overhanging limbs of cover and the thick burned timber. Hey, you got him. You hit him, Mike. You hit yeah, him. Yeah, you got, got him. Got him That's good. a good shot. Yeah. He's moving around over there a little bit in them trees. I better get ready and get another one. Yeah. Well, Mike, shall we go over there and see what we got? Well, I can't see. I can't see. Let me look over there. Right there. You better go ahead, Mike. As they advanced into the burn, they were cautious not to move too fast. It's always best to take your time when approaching a downed animal. In a burn area like this, and with the light fading, it would be easy to overlook an animal even the size of an elk.
there, Slim. Are you ready to go get that elk? Yeah, I'm ready. Let's okay. Go. Let's get mounted up and go get him. All right. All right, let's go. Come on, boys. The weather in early September can be quite warm in the daytime hours. It's very important to get the game skinned and quartered and into a cool environment as soon as possible. Well, Mike, let's see if we can find this critter in here. Oh, the bear might have found him already. Well, I hope not. I don't want to run into a grizzly in there. Oh, I don't either. <coughs> He's right up here not too far. Yeah. I'll look good on the way. All right. So keep this horse to do this. Mike, he looks just as good as he did last night. Oh, he does. Yeah, he's a dandy. Yeah. He looks better than he did last night. Yeah, I think these horns grow a little bit during the night, you don't think you? think so? I think so. Boy. Yes, really, sir. Really a good one. It's all right. Six all the way. Yeah. Well, let's get to work and peel him out. All right. Taped out and ready to go. Well, now all we got to do is get back to camp with this monster. caressed the meadow as Bert and Mike made their final exit from this historic area. For these sportsmen, the Wyoming Rockies will forever leave a fragrance of wilderness, adventure, and history. No one but he who has partaken thereof can understand the keen delight of hunting in lonely lands. For him, the joy of the horse well ridden and the rifle well held. For him, the long days of toil and hardship resolutely endured and crowned at the end with triumph. Thank you.